Well, thank you for having me, Sarah. It's always a pleasure. Um, so we're talking today about your new book, The Beast's Garden, which I just adored. Oh, thank you. Um, I'm so glad to hear that. No, it was really lovely. Even before I read it, when I heard that you would be doing a retelling of Beauty and the Beast in Nazi Germany, I was like, in. <laughs> because, you know, um, it's such an unusual kind of setting for a fairy tale retelling. Mm-hmm. Um, could you tell me what gave you the idea? To... It's always difficult for a writer to explain how ideas come. And so probably the best way that I can explain it is that when I was doing the research for my previous novel, The Wild Girl, uh, The Wild Girl is a story um, about the young woman that told the Grimm brothers many of the world's most famous fairy tales. And it's a beautiful love story. It's a, the story of the forbidden romance between Dorch and Wilde and Willem Grimm. And one of her stories is a version of beautiful and the Beast. It's a, a version that I'd, I'd never read before. I'd never seen anywhere else, and it, it, it was collected in the Grimm brothers, you know, early, you know, books about fairy tales. And it's a story about. It, it is a retelling of Beauty and the Beast, except that the the heroine is far more active. She doesn't just kind of weep and then promise to marry the beast. She actually has to follow him and fight for him and outwit the enchantress who first cursed him. And she has to follow him for seven years. And every day he drops one white feather and one drop of blood. And for seven years she follows his trail of feathers and blood till at last she can save him. And I was just really moved by this particularly beautiful version of Beauty and the Beast. And I kept thinking to myself, I love that story so much, I'd love to retell it one day. And then I just put it in, into my in, in, into my back brain, into my subconscious, because I was very busy. I was writing, you know, The Wild Girl, and I was doing my doctorate in fairy tales at the same time. So I had a fairly hefty workload. And then as I went on um, and I was researching, I was writing my chapter on the Grimm brothers in my doctoral exegesis, and I found out that um, Hitler had actually loved the Grimm brothers, and he had um, he had recommended that every household should have a copy of the Grimm's fairy tales in their house. So he 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 only really recommended two books: Mein Kampf and Grimm fairy tales. I had no idea. (laughs) I know. And I was actually really um, shocked by this, troubled by this. And then I found out that after the fall of the Third Reich and after Hitler's death, you know, when the you know, when the Allies had had won the war and they were trying to find some way to bring Germany back from the ruin into which it had been thrown, well, they had what they called the denazification program and they banned the Grimm fairy tales at that time. So, you know, the the Grimm fairy tales were actually banned in Germany for decades. And I was really troubled by this. One of the things, I mean, you know, obviously all of my life I've been, I've, I've hated and feared the Nazi regime and I've hated the fact that they burnt books. And yet the Grimm fairy tales, which are stories that have brought me so much um, beauty and comfort in dark and difficult times of my own, they had been banned. And I went to bed really, really troubled by this, unable to sleep, troubled by what I was doing with the Grimm brothers in the Wild Girls, and I just couldn't sleep. So I got up about midnight or one o'clock in the morning and I read a World War II thriller, which are <laughs> uh, one of the things I love to do when um, you know I'm, I'm deep in research for a book and I need to read something very different. So I, I read a World War thriller, the whole thing, and I fell asleep. And then in my dreams, my brain put together all these three things that were troubling me, the, you know, the Grimm brothers, the, the desire to retell a story of Dorch and Wilde's that I had actually used um, in The Wild Girl, and this idea of, you know, a World War II thriller. And in the, the state between being asleep and slowly waking up is called the hypnopompic state. I call it the Shadowlands. And it's where I get many of my most idea, you know, my very best ideas. Mm. And so, in that hypnopompic state, I had a vision of a girl, a young woman, dressed in a golden dress, singing in what seemed like a nightclub. The nightclub was filled with SS men, and I knew, I knew that she was German, but I also knew that she was some kind of resistance fighter. <laughs> and I woke up, and I was absolutely electrified 
by this idea. I actually sat up and wrote in my diary about 15 pages trying to get all the ideas down as they came to me. And that was, that was the beginning of the book. It was just a vision that was sent to me out of my subconscious and I don't know why, but once it came to me, I knew I had to write it. And the idea obsessed me, it haunted me, until at last I ended up with this beautiful book. <laughs> Which I'm very glad you did. Mm -hmm. um, another thing about the book that I found really interesting was the number of actual real historical characters in mm -hmm. it. Did you find it daunting? There's one point when um, Ava is eavesdropping on a conversation between Hitler and Unity Mitford. Mm -hmm. Was that, did you ever sort of... As a writer, is it difficult to go from your fictional character to a real character like that? Um, obviously, a book like this involves a great deal of intensive research. Um, it, most of the characters in the book uh, are based on real people. Not just Hitler, <laughs> but all the resistance fighters. Um, you know, these are real people who you know lived double lives, who fought desperately to stand up against the Third Reich, who who you know risked their own lives and the lives of their families in order to help people and save people. They're incredibly um, you know brave and courageous people, and I felt it was very important to honour the truth of what they had done. Um, it yes, it, it it was difficult, but. Um, well, you know, once you begin to, to recreate someone on the page, it doesn't matter whether they're an imaginary person or a real person, it's still a process of imagination to have them move through the space that you have created, to put words into their mouths, to, you know, fix upon little mannerisms. I mean, it's part of the process of creating fiction is to bring people to life on the page. It doesn't matter if they're inspired by real people or they're completely figments of your imagination. The process is the same. And in one sense, it's actually easier because many, many um, of these people who, who did actually live wrote letters, wrote diaries, wrote done accounts. You know, they spoke in their own natural voice. And so once I have read and studied them, I, I can hear their natural voice in my own ear and so I can recreate it on the page. While um, you know, someone who I invented purely out of my own imagination, I have to invent their voice as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, could you tell me a bit about your process? A book like this, so rich in historical detail mm. and um, fairy tales and poetry and so much music. Like, yes. How do you bring that all together? Oh, uh, it's always. Um, it is a process, of course. Um, I'm a notebooker, so I've actually brought along my notebooks to show you today. So the, the Beast Garden is a big book, so it has two notebooks. <laughs> so this, this was my first one, and the opening pages of it are actually um, the notes that I made in my diary straight after that dream. You could actually, I could actually read to you exactly what I wrote the morning I woke up after having had had that dream. Please do. Oh, really? <laughs> All oh, right. I, I, would say. I couldn't sleep last night for worrying about the wild girl. Not just that I now only have six months to write the book, but also that I didn't know my secondary plot. And I go on. Um, <laughs> Um, I needed something new, strange, unexpected, surprising. And then I go on, if I can find it, the actual part where I woke up. I woke this morning and lay in that dim borderland between awake and asleep, that place of all creative dreaming, and the idea came to me. Why not have a tale set in World War II? Perhaps it could be, uh, you know, she, she has to flee. She could live wild in the wood. Perhaps she joins the German resistance and she carries with her everywhere a copy of the grim fairy tales as a kind of talisman. Perhaps, um, what is it? I, I don't want to read too much of it. Um, this idea, it feels, it, um, it's so fragile and damp still, but it feels good, it feels right. It feels as if this is going to be too scary, but it absolutely seems to have some kind of power to it. Which it truly does. Um, when I read it, I just couldn't believe no one had thought to do this before. Everything fits so well, all the imagery, mm. just the... It used to give me a little thrill of excitement. You know, people who would, would say to me, Kate, what are you working on now? And I'd say, I'm writing a retelling of the Grimm's 
Beauty and the Beast set in Nazi <laughs> Germany. And I'd feel these goosebumps prickle all over my body <laughs> with the with the sheer dread and excitement of it, you know. Well, and because nothing could be more monstrous to people. Monstrous, I should say. Exactly, exactly right. This this yeah. story just seemed to fit. I mean, the two stories seemed to fit together so, so well. Yeah. And um, I actually, I, I was in the midst of writing The Wild Girl at that time. I was very close to, to deadline. I only had six months to finish writing this book. And I spent two and a half weeks planning yes. and doing a great deal of research for this book and then I had to wrench my mind away. My initial plan had been to have the, it being part of the wild girl that I'd weave it through and then I saw it was too big an idea so I had to take it out and put it in a drawer and then I had to I had to wait a year, even two years before I could begin to write that story that was burning a hole in my imagination. <laughs> um, uh, well it really does, it, it was really I mean, I don't even have words. I just devoured it in a single night and, um, and just found it such a powerful story. And particularly one thing that struck me was the line of, from Rilke's poem mm. um, about love being difficult. Love is difficult. That's what I wonder if I can find it. Where did I put the book to? To get the, the whole to, line. Yeah. To read it to you. It was very powerful and, and seemed to carry throughout the whole book and just... Did, did you come across it in your research or did you already know Well, I, um, I've actually been a, a great lover of Wilkie's poetry ever since I, I was a teenager. I bought um, a, a collection of his poetry from a school fete when I was about 16 years old mm -hmm. and I fell madly in love with his poetry and he's been one of my favourite poets ever since. And so I've been steadily reading him for all the decades <laughs> since I was 16. And then... Um, so many of his ideas, you know, for example, Wilkie's poetry is full of the imagery of roses and full of the imagery of birds, um, which were two kind of symbols that were very important to me, obviously, in the rewriting of Beauty and the Beast. Mm -hmm. um, and his poetry is all about the difficulties of loving and the importance of being true to oneself, which were very much the sort of struggle that Ava has in this book, Ava is my heroine. Um, you know, she is a young woman who has, you know, lived in Berlin all of her life. She was a teenager when Hitler came to power in 1933. Um, she's, you know, 19 years old in 1938, and the book begins on Crystal Night, um, which was, uh, you know, the first line of the book is, Ava fell in love the night the Nazis first showed their true face to the world. And that, that was the night. Um, it was a terrible, terrible time, and she has to choose um, in this book, you know, whether she stands up for what she believes is right, whether she tries to help and save people, or whether she only, you know, you know, bunkers down and protects herself and her own family. It's a terrible choice, mm -hmm. and all the way through, I kept thinking, what would I do if I was her? How would I, how would I manage to live in that kind of terror and that kind of brutality? So. You know, so, so Ava is obviously the beauty of my story, <laughs> and the Beast is is her husband who is a Nazi officer. But the line from um, Wilki reads: um, "For one human being to love another human being, that is perhaps the most difficult task that has been entrusted to us." Which really does lie at the heart of, mm. of the struggle here. Ava has so many doubts and insecurities about Leo. And um, they both have to sort of reconcile different beliefs and find a way to move through that together. And it was just really beautiful to read. I'm, <laughs> I'm so glad because it was incredibly important to me. I always saw this book as being a love story. Yes, it is set in Berlin, the heart of the Third Reich. Yes, it is a story about, about bravery and resistance in the face of impossible odds. Yes, it's a story, it's an adventure story and a suspense <laughs> thriller, but at its heart, it's, it's truly a love story. And it's not just, it's um, you know, both Ava and her husband, Leo, who is an, an officer in, in the pay of Hitler's secret intelligence service. Both of them have to struggle towards each other and find, you know, find some way to love each other and to realise that it is actually their love that will save 
yeah, both of them. Yeah, yeah. It it's just it was wonderful, and it sounds as though it was a perfect storm that came together to to bring this mm. book. Well, see, well, the the subconscious mind is an incredible thing. I am a great believer. I just put ideas in there, and then they sort of fester away in in, in there, <laughs> often for a very very long time. Just and, marinating away. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. And then you know, perhaps a better metaphor would be like a compost where you throw the seeds in. <laughs> And then leave them in the dark for a long time, and then you know something takes root and puts out a little leaf and a little blossom, and that's exactly what this book was. You know, it was it just seemed to come from nowhere. But when I look back at it, I see that you know you know my preoccupations had been there for a long time. Um, I'd been completely fascinated by the Second World War since I was twelve, when I went. I actually read Anne Frank's diary. And, um, you know, it was all my reading up until then had been in a blight and a Narnia. And I read Anne Frank's diary and I could not believe that wow. she did, did not escape at the end. And I have known all of my life that I was going to set a book, you know, during World War Two. I used to call it my French resistance story, which is what I thought I was going to write. <laughs> um, and I, I collected, you know, research books over decades preparing to write this book. Um, I actually wrote this book three times. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So the first time I wrote it as if it was a diary and with a series of letters, you know, from other characters. Um, I love the book, the, the Guernsey Literary and Potato Peel Pie Society, oh, yeah. <laughs> which is all told in letters. So my first attempt was to do it in that way, but it just didn't work for me. Um, I didn't get that sense of sustained narrative that I love so much. So I rewrote the book as if it was a memoir all in first person, all from Ava's point of view. And, you know, I wrote the whole book um, that way. And then I just realised it was too big a story to be confined in that way. And so I changed it. I rewrote the whole book and I had to do it line by line. I couldn't just do, you know, a global search and replace. No, well, you have such a wide cast of characters. And, I know. Um, so it went so from many... being third person you know, I'm sorry, first person with only one point of view to being third person with a multitude of voices. So and a fairy tale woven throughout. Yeah, that's right. So it is one reason why it took me so long to write this book was because I, I literally did write it three times in, in three different forms until I, I found the form, the form that w worked. That was going to yeah. work. You know, so many people think that writers, you know, pull up a blank page, you know, chapter one. <laughs> The end. <laughs> and it's not like that at all. No. It's a much more difficult and complex process. Um, well, uh, Kate, thank you so much for coming in. Oh, that's my pleasure. Um, and The Beast Garden is available from Booktopia.